Good morning. I am Nick von Ortes, uh, the director of the uh, MA program in International Science and Technology Policy, and also the director of uh, one of the two institutes uh, that is managing the program, the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy. Um, I am uh, here uh, to welcome everyone and to introduce uh, our Dean, um, Alisa Ayres, uh, is the Dean of the School of, uh, Elliot School of International Affairs, uh, who will welcome um, and open the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, and good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see everyone here, those in person as well as our participants online. We've got a full day program, so I know we'll have people popping in and out throughout the course of the day, uh, popping in and out online as well. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to be able to celebrate the golden anniversary, 50 years of international science and technology policy at the Elliott School. I think all of you are aware, but it bears repeating, the Elliott School has been a leader at the intersection of s and policy and international affairs for decades. In the 1970s, oh, our, our timeline has gone away, but we've got an amazing timeline. In the 1970s, at George Washington University alongside MIT pioneered the development of academic programs and research institutes that integrated these fields. Um, We'll have that timeline back up as we had it earlier this morning, and I would encourage everyone to come take a look on the fourth floor corridor right outside the IISTP office area. This beautiful timeline really takes a look at the highlights um, and commemorates the development uh, of the growth of our focus on s and policy and its international dimensions. So the creation of GW's International Science and Technology Policy Graduate Program, the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy, and then later the Space Policy Institute. So all taken together have cemented our prominence in the field. These institutions have educated hundreds of exceptional international science and technology policy professionals, many of whom are here today and will be joining as well. Later this spring, the 50th cohort of our students from the Elliott School's International Science and Technology Policy degree program will graduate on this occasion, it's worth reflecting on the role of science and technology in international affairs. From medical research and energy production to artificial intelligence and space technologies, s and policies that enhance innovation are crucial to US leadership, crucial to US security and to our economic prosperity. In order to meet the urgency of today's global threats, including the pandemic, climate crisis, cybersecurity concerns, it's increasingly important that we have international affairs professionals, practitioners who have strong backgrounds in science and technology. So in educating such practitioners and in facilitating the kind of communication between the world of policy and the world of s and our international science and technology policy program and its affiliated research institutes have a crucial role to play. So today's event exploring the past, present and future of international s and would be timely, even if we weren't celebrating the golden anniversary. We'll hear today from faculty who have been at the heart of s and here at the Elliott School as they discuss the evolution of our international science and technology policy program and our research institutes. Then we will have the honor of welcoming a panel of distinguished program alumni who will share insights from their experience in a diverse array of s and fields. Later this afternoon, we will come back for another top level panel of s and experts featuring program alumni and faculty associates who will analyze the current state of international s and and look to the future. Finally, we will be treated to a keynote address from MIT's William B. Bonvillian. And don't forget that we have a reception uh, at the end of our program today in the evening to cap off the day's proceedings. So it is a full and very appropriate lineup for a day that is dedicated to celebrating international science and technology policy. I wanna thank all of our speakers in advance and I look forward to what you have to say and to hearing insights into this important field. So with those few words of welcome and introduction, I will turn things back to Professor Vonortas 
Uh, you know him well. He is the director of our International Science and Technology Policy Program, as well as the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy here at the Elliott School. Thank you, and back to you, Professor Vanortas. Thank you, thank you, Alisa. This is a, this is a great, great, a great introduction. Um, um, we are celebrating 50 years. Actually, uh, we were celebrating 50 years in 2020, uh, but uh, <clears throat> um, the pandemic hit. Just imagine, just imagine the the, the coincidence. A, a, a program on science and technology policy celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary right at the beginning of the pandemic, um, <clears throat> which shut down the university. So what we are celebrating actually today is uh, the 50th anniversary of the graduation of the first class of the program in 1972. <laughs> um, some representatives of, of, of the first um, um, graduates actually, uh, not the first, the early graduates are, are, are here. Um, but in the first panel, um, we will hear uh, from some of the very important people for the, for, for the program. Um, the, the, the whole program is actually scheduled to be around um, people, alumni and, and, and faculty, and certainly not everybody uh, is here. This program is one of the earliest in the country and in the world, actually. Um, it has graduated uh, a lot, many hundreds of people. Um, they are in critical positions like those that you will see uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, certainly we could not feel everyone, um, but uh, many should be um, present or online here. So before, before I introduce my esteemed colleagues uh, for the first panel, I wanted to uh, to introduce actually to make sure that everybody knows what the program is about right now. If we can have it, Christine, on the... Um, <clears throat> so, so these are very, very, very few slides um, like uh, those uh, I used a few days ago to introduce the, 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 the people from the incoming class. Um, we have amazing applicants, um, and uh, the other day we had an event for them. So, uh, so, so um, 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 here is our program. is a 40, 40 credit program. Um, here is uh, the the core the the core courses for the field. The the first one, the cornerstone, right that everybody takes uh, right up front, and then the the sequence uh, in policy. Um, the, 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 the issue here is for everybody, every student to have a, a minimum common uh, background when, when they, start, uh, they start the program. Um, next, please. So um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, at the end of the, of the Do we have something? Um, okay, so uh, at the end of the program, uh, when everybody is about to graduate, they take the capstone, is the last course. It's, it's divided, it's a four credit. Um, it used to be three in, in one course, now it is four, and it's divided in two semesters. This is a group work. Um, uh, our people at that point are supposed to know policy, to be able to work in teams, and that's what will they do here. It's a uh, teamwork. Um, they choose topics, uh, they create the teams, they choose the topics, and they choose a client uh, who is interested in their topic. Um, so the first, in the first half of the course, the first semester of the, of the course, they are um, um, doing the preparatory, all this preparatory work. And in the second, which is their last semester in the program, they carry out the work and they present it um, in different forums. Um, now, between these, um, we have um, we have a concentration field. Uh, the concentration the concentration field will will be uh, fifteen credits, 
And, and here, uh, there is a lot of choice of uh, courses that we teach, but also uh, courses uh, outside the program uh, of the Elliott School, but, but even beyond, um, people can take, uh, can create their fields from um, the whole university. So um, here are some, some examples, really examples of uh, fields that or specialization that people have done in the past. But in reality, the program is uh, so flexible that uh, people can name their field, uh, depending on where they expect to go, uh, what is their dream. Um, they have to persuade me that uh, the, the title and the collection of courses that they have put under that title make sense and, and then I will say yes. Um, so this is this is the kind of things that that people might might um, work on, but also many more. Uh, for example, a lot of people now are interested in artificial intelligence, um, um, uh, biology, uh, huge interest in in in, in biology. Um, they. Of course, space space policy, but particular issues under space policy, like uh, debris, um, um, are of uh, great demand here. Um, and then, and then, um, uh, in addition to the concentration, we will have um, some preparatory courses. Uh, uh, people will take uh, uh, what we call analytical competency, usually early. We want them to take this early. Um, this will be, uh, we have a choice of courses that they can choose from, um, but also they can bring something on the outside with a good argument. Um, and this is supposed to be um, their, their ability to actually analyze policy, um, to be able to understand, at least understand when somebody shows them an analysis um, and ask them to read graphs and sometimes read equations. <laughs> so depending on, 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 on where they go. Um, uh, so the analytical competency uh, uh, provides this, this background. And, and finally, of course, there is some completely elective courses that they can take, um, um, they can choose from anywhere they wish. They, they can choose from international affairs, the uh, whole university, but also they can use for these courses um, the, um, the consortium of universities that exist in, at, uh, in Washington, which includes basically all the major universities in the region. And, and, and if there is a course somewhere else offered by somebody um, that we do not offer at GW is, is really very simple um, to go take the course uh, there. Um, it's, it's a very, very interesting thing. Up to two courses can be taken outside of the university. Right? Um, uh, um, now, <clears throat> uh, I, wanted, I wanted to actually uh, take you because many of you are not familiar with, with our faculty these days. Um, so this is what you see in this in this in this um, um, slide are the is the, the 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 faculty members that are full time full time in the suite, right? Uh, right up on top is our newest acquisition, <laughs> um, Professor Bates uh, was just hired just a month ago um, hired and he is going to be our new assistant professor uh, specializing on space policy. Uh, Henry Herzfeld is, has been around for, for, for a long time, also space policy. Nina Kelsey um, is our specialist in energy and the environment. Scott Pace, of course, that you will see now in a few minutes, is, is the director of the Space Policy Institute. And, and of the specialization is obvious, and, and myself at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to this, to this faculty, and I must say here, and I'm looking at the Dean when I say uh, this, um, this first slide, if, if I had shown you the first slide two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic, there would be three more names on that slide on, on the full-time faculty. And these three names, three, three full-time faculty left the program. Um, they were actually poached away by other top universities 
two went to the University of British Columbia um, and one to Johns Hopkins. Um, so we are hoping for replacement. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> Okay, um, um, we have then uh, a lot of people who deal with our students, but they are not full-time uh, professors. Here are some, um, Anthony Ames, uh, Pete Hayes with space, uh, Ames is non-space, non, non Carol Kunz uh, with usually teaching AI, Dana Johnson, again um, on, on space, and our newest, the two at the bottom, Otaviano Canuto, is, is an amazing, if you see his CV, you will not believe how can one do all this um, in a single lifetime. Uh, from executive director of the World Bank and the IMF to, to, to vice president of the Inter-American Development Bank um, to full professor in, two, in the two major universities in Brazil and Latin America, minister in Brazil and so forth. So, so he's uh, recently retired from, from the World Bank actually. And together with the last person there, Rich Leshner, uh, they are going to co-teach our capstone. So I think, I think the students will be absolutely um, happy with this choice. These two top people, Rich Leshner, of course, that you will see later uh, here in the day um, talking to you, is, is, is a very, very uh, well-known person in, in space policy. So we will have one person in space and another person in non-space teaching the same class, and we are very happy about that. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> But then there are, there are several other people who teach for us and, and engage in with the program. Christopher Cahill, uh, Chris is the, now the chair of the chemistry department. Uh, Pascal Ehrenfood, uh, very, very prominent um, um, person of Austrian background um, with lots of managerial positions and, and, and huge academic productivity in space. Um, uh, John Klein, um, uh, again with, uh, with space, Kei Koizumi in the room um, on, um, uh, from the OSTP. He has taught frequently in the past our uh, cornerstone class, actually, and we hope in the future he will do the same. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and John Longston. John Longston, of course, that you will see in a few uh, in a few minutes, uh, who is uh, the, 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 the person who set this every, everything up, All right? Please, next. <clears throat> uh, and finally, a few more. Uh, Claudia Raniger, uh, she teaches courses on space and medicine. Uh, so medicine in space, I guess. I don't know if I make it, uh, I said correctly. Doug Shaw, um, Sharon uh, Squasoni, um, these two are uh, research professors. Uh, they are uh, they are sitting in the suite, and 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 they specialize on nuclear energy and nuclear policy. Uh, Zoe Zan Farber, um, she is from the School of uh, Engineering. Uh, she's associating with us, and and she is an expert in space. And Al Taik in the room, um, who is our research professor and and deals with issues. Uh, of science policy. Um, okay, uh, let's. <clears throat> now, um, what 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 happens with our graduates? Uh, our graduates actually uh, end up in a lot of uh, different places, and that's why the program is flexible because they don't go to one or two or three places; they go all all over. They come from all over. So, so we've had in the past, you will hear today somebody who, who has a philosophy background um, when he came into the program. Um, they come from all over the place and they go all over the place. So, so the program is very flexible, but here are some well-known well -known, um, uh, places in the United States where they may end up. But I want to say that uh, uh, a lot of them end up in the private sector now. Uh, the big consulting, all the big consultancies have uh, specializations on science, technology, and innovation, of course, management. Um, and several go to state, state governments, right? Um, uh, so next. 
Uh, um, uh, here are uh, prominent alumni, but I think we don't need necessarily to, to, to spend a lot of time because uh, some we will see alumni um, all day long. Um, and finally, uh, the program, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's a very, very interesting thing that this is, I think, the only program in the Elliott School that is managed by two research institutes, <laughs> not by one. A number of, 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 of programs in the Elliott School are not managed by research institutes because, um, as I, we will hear from my colleagues now, the Elliott School uh, has been set up as a professional school of international affairs um, and chose uh, since the very beginning not to offer a PhD degree. However, if you do not offer PhD degrees, uh, you have a problem with research. And, and here we have two research institutes. So we actually offer PhD degrees in science and technology policy, and we manage the program, the PhD program with that track of the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration actually of the university. So um, people apply for science and technology policy uh, for doctoral studies. Our institutes manage those, that program in a different school. And, and we use those people mostly, um, they are closer, they're PhD students, they are closer to research. And, and that's, uh, we need more longer term that master students that, that will focus on the next job, right? Um, so <clears throat> so this, uh, these two institutes, and you will hear a lot about them, I think, uh, 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 today, these two institutes manage the program and give it a, a sort of a research flavor, uh, more of a research flavor than, than, than simply policy, uh, policy, you know, practice. Um, okay, so um, with... Uh, with uh, uh, I have delayed here, and I wanted to actually introduce uh, my 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 two colleagues. The two colleagues appear on this uh, on this podium right now. Both of them are extremely important people, and I, I don't really think I need to introduce them. Professor John Longston um, really set up the whole the whole operation here, and I hope in his remarks he will remind us how and when. Um, and who the names of the important people then. Um, uh, Professor Pace, um, uh, Scott Pace is the director of the Space Policy Institute, a very big uh, name in um, that field in, in, in space policy uh, with uh, his latest uh, important uh, assignment in the, um, as executive director of the Space Pol uh, Space Space Council of the United States, if I uh, put it correctly, um, um, in the previous administration, the administration of uh, the Trump administration. Um, that means uh, the most important person for space policy uh, below the vice president. Um, so he is responsible. If you don't like anything, he is responsible for what has happened with the with the new direction of the space policy in the United States to go to Mars and and all that stuff. Um, so uh, he is the one. Um, <laughs> so we are we are very fortunate to have them to have them uh, with us. And, 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 and unfortunately, on this podium right now, we start with the old. You see how the event moves, right? We start with the old and go to the, to the, to the more recent. Uh, all the three people will have white hair like me, and, and, and they can talk about evolution uh, and so forth. So please, John and, and uh, Scott. Um, I'm the only one with really white hair. <laughs> and I have it, right? So is there an order? Do I start? Yeah, you start. Since I was here at the beginning. Uh, where do I start? Um, science and technology policy research has been going on at George Washington since the mid 1960s. NASA gave a large grant to the university 
uh, to create a program of policy studies in science and technology. Uh, that uh, grant was a kind of directly a product of the, of the ideas of the NASA administrator at the time, Jim Webb, James Webb, who believed that he was an innovator in higher education. And he mandated, he also knew the university. I think he had been a former trustee uh, and uh, said, well, you then you're not very strong in science and technology, engineering, physics, et cetera. So let's do policy after all we're in Washington. And he said it should not be part of any one school or department. Uh, and so he mandated as a condition of the grant that there be a university wide program in science and technology policy headed by a vice president of the university. So that's where it came from, policy program of policy studies in science and technology. I was teaching at Catholic University here in Washington uh, when it was set up, uh, already interested in space issues. That's what I was doing my dissertation on and saw an organization doing exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, and so uh, through various channels, I affiliated with the program in 1968. So I've been in GW a long time, 54 years now, uh, I, while I was still a faculty member at Catholic, and then uh, spent a couple of years uh, trying to become a faculty member at GW. And that's where this program, the teaching program, came from. At that point, there was at GW a School of Public and International Affairs, SPIA, uh, which had both the international affairs and the public policy portfolios. Uh, and uh, that school hired a new dean. New deans are times for innovation uh, and opportunities for innovation. A new dean named Burton Sapin, Bert Sapin, uh, a student of U.S. foreign policy and decision making, and I and an associate talked Dean Sapin into creating a new program, teaching program at the graduate level in science and technology policy, uh, so that I could get a job. Uh, uh, the university. Uh, the, uh, created two tenure track faculty positions for that program. We put together a curriculum that's not fundamentally different than what Nick just outlined in, in, in its uh, structure and, and, and direction uh, and admitted our first five students in the fall semester of 1970. Uh, Christine, if you can show this image that I gave you. Is it there? There it is. Okay. Uh, uh, these were the first two faculty members. Uh, John Hanessian had been associate with the program of policy studies and was my co-conspirator in uh, convincing Dean Sapin of the opportunity to create a teaching program to complement the existing research program. Uh, John had worked at the National Academy during the International Geophysical Year, had been in a number of universities in the uh, 60s since the IGY uh, before coming to the program of policy studies. Uh, Armenian in, in heritage and in style. Uh, uh, and then the young guy, God, his hair wasn't white then. Uh, 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 so the two of us were the first faculty members in the program. Um, I can remember some of the names of the first cohorts of, the st of students, but not all of them. So I won't mention any. Uh, uh, in, over the next couple of years, I think the longest serving alumna is Jenny Bond, Jennifer Bond. 1972 when you started? Yeah. Uh, we, we did custom service at that time. New students coming to town, I went to the airport and picked her up. Uh, uh, 
uh, couldn't do that anymore, was wearing with bells on her ears and a cowboy hat coming from Arizona. Uh, we'll let her later talk about what happened after that. Uh, Hanessian was a strange character. He was very ambitious, global contacts, hard to focus. And one of the requirements of his job was finishing his PhD, which he had been going in and out of at Oxford University in, in uh, the United Kingdom for uh, the better part of a decade. Unfortunately, he didn't finish and uh, couldn't continue in the faculty in 1970. Was he here when you got here, Jenny, 72? That was his last year. Then he went to work for the National Science Foundation and unfortunately was one of the people aboard a DC-10 that crashed outside Paris uh, and, and, uh, and he perished in that, uh, in that crash. Then we hired uh, someone who has just retired from the Elliott School, uh, Henry Now, was going to be our specialist in nuclear policy. Uh, Henry very quickly broadened his portfolio, moved to the international affairs area, and basically left the program. Uh, we retained the slot, and then it was Al Tyke, who was a good, already a good friend, uh, that joined the program in 70, what, five? something like that, 76. Um, one of the reflections I've had in putting together this early history is what if there had been a Trachtenberg School of Public Policy in existence uh, at the time we started this program? Would we have ended up in the Public Policy School rather than the International Affairs School? Uh, I think the answer is probably. So it's a, 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 a quirk of the organization of the university that we ended up in what is now the Elliott School. Um, 1983 was a, a transition year uh, in many ways. Uh, Dean Mayo, who had been uh, uh, the vice president and head of the program of policy studies, had a stroke, uh, could not continue in his position. Uh, and I became kind of by default the head of the program of policy studies. Uh, and the then president of the university, Lloyd Elliott, and the provost of the university, Rod French, decided that what GW should do is compete with Georgetown and have its own school of international affairs. And so a school of international affairs Basically, the public policy uh, part of, of the school was taken away uh, in limbo, I guess, until the Trachtenberg School was created. And we became the School of International Affairs in 1983. And didn't change much with the program uh, because our focus had always been uh, the intersection between domestic and international policy in the, in the science and technology area. Um, at that point, we hired uh, Al Tyke went to AAAS, American Association, the Advancement of Science, and we hired a man named Robert Rycroft, Bob Rycroft, uh, <clears throat> for the number two position. And Bob stayed here until uh, in ill health, he retired a couple of years ago, and he passed away last year unfortunately. Makes it sound like I'm the last person standing uh, or sitting. Uh, um, so we hired Bob, who was an energy and environmental specialist. And, and I'll just start with, uh, end with two more things. After the Challenger accident in 1986, uh, there was a market opportunity for a think tank dealing with space policy. A lot of discussion in the space community in town. And I, I almost literally woke up one morning and said, hey, that's what we're already doing. And, and convinced the Dean by then Mickey East, Maurice East, uh, 
to uh, support the idea of chartering a separate institute called the Space Policy Institute. Uh, and the university agreed. And so in 1987, basically we just put a new, a different sign on the door in addition to science and technology policy. We didn't really change what we were doing. And at that point, it was just me uh, that, that was the Space Policy Institute. It's grown over the years, as I suspect Scott will talk about a little bit. Um, and then in 1988, Lloyd Elliott, uh, who had been president for the university for a long period of time, retired, and the trustees of the university decided to name the international school that he had helped create in his honor as the Elliott School. Uh, that happened in 1988. And I, I didn't go away, but uh, uh, I think I can stop talking and, uh, and probably Nick should talk next because he came in 91. 90, 90, 90. 1990. Uh, so you're over so, to you. I, okay. Um, just, just a couple of things. Uh, 1983 was a, a, um, a year. It was also the year that I arrived in New York City to, to do my PhD at uh, New York University. <laughs> so, so it, and John is also from New York University. I always wondered whether he hired me because we have the same alma mater. Um, well, the one, the one comment I'll make is that graduation when we were both active faculty, we were very attractive in our uh, <laughs> purple regalia. Uh, NYU had yes. a bold purple uh, cap and gown, yeah. so that was fun. Yeah, so, so, so uh, the only thing to, 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 to say here is that I arrived in 1990. Um, it was a great surprise to me um, that, that someone wanted an economist actually to, to, to deal with uh, science and technology policy because uh, I had always been in economics department. I was coming up from one of the top 10 economics departments, uh, very theoretical, very mathematical. Uh, my, my, my colleagues were talking about technology supposedly, but really they did not know uh, what that was. But I, I had always uh, on my own in private, I had an interest in, in policy. So when Robert Rycroft actually called me abroad, I was serving my service in the Greek Navy, uh, literally. Um, and, and he called abroad and he said, um, you know, we have an opening for somebody like, like your profile. Would you come over to, to, to give a, to, to, for, a, for, a, for an interview? I said, I am, I am all the other way from the, on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, I am a soldier, really. I don't have a passport because it had been revoked. Uh, the, the, because this is, this is what happens in, in countries with, uh, with conscript uh, um, military. They take away your passport uh, just in case you want to escape abroad, right? So I don't have a passport right now. Um, can you send this in, in, in writing? Um, and I will try to get a passport. Uh, so anyway, the, the, the rest was, uh, was, is, is history. But the reason I understood later this program decided to hire an economist was that the field was changing. See, the field was changing around that time and, and the US was under intense pressure from Japan. Japan was, was, was really, uh, uh, really looked in the late 80s as it, it, it was throwing all the right punches and the US all the wrong punches. Um, so the idea was uh, how come in the country that spends uh, as much as the next six combined um, is actually cannot actually get its act together uh, international international competitiveness how uh, and it was it was the field was moving from science uh, to technology and actually slowly to innovation. So what do we do with this technology that we will be pro that we are producing, right? And innovation, as I always say in the classroom, is very different from technological development. These are 
different things, right? Uh, technological uh, uh, development is part of innovation, can be part of innovation, but innovation does not need technological development. Innovation can have, can be of other types, can be organizational innovation, can be whatever, social innovation, can be whatever you can imagine. So technological uh, change can be, is a good part of, can be a good part of innovation, but innovation is really something that crosses into uh, the organizations that actually do something with this technology, and these are businesses. Right? So that's where the, the field opens up then to economics and, and business. And, and I guess as somebody like me, uh, who is interested in multinational corporations and small companies and finance and I know, uh, uh, risk investments and, and, and research and so forth, um, came into the program. Um, I was uh, in 1990 and 10 years later, I think in 2000 or 2001, John uh, was graceful enough to, to, to allow me to take over the, the essentially the program and the, and the Institute, the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy. I did 12 years then, I, I went away 2012 and um, I am back now. So let me, let me turn it to, to Scott. Scott. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I'm the I'm the young guy on this panel, uh, which is sort of disturbing. Um, so um, I guess one of the, the first things uh, I would I would say to position uh, myself here. I haven't been here since uh, the beginning. I arrived here in 2008 after doing a tour at, at at NASA headquarters. So I've been here now 14 years, which is kind of amazing. Um, but I'm sort of the second generation at many many levels. Uh, I'm the second generation in terms of uh, leadership, uh, you know, within the within the institute and the group. Uh, I'm sort of the second generation, kind of a bridging uh, entity between the initial foundation of s and policy studies, if you will, and what the current problems are today. So I'm not, uh, I would argue, uh, where maybe some of the more cutting edge s and issues are. Certainly on space, I am, but um, I'm, I've kind of been in this in between position. Uh, I started off as a physics major, uh, as an undergraduate at Harvey Mudd College, which itself was founded in the aftermath of World War II uh, out in the Claremont Colleges to look not only educating people in science and engineering disciplines, uh, but also in, in humanistic disciplines. In fact, one of the requirements at Harvey Mudd was that you minor in something other than your technical major. Uh, your only majors that were offered were engineering, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Um, but there was very common of engineering majors and econ minors. I was a physics major and a history of science minor. Uh, and I had friends of mine who were physics majors and dance minors. I mean, so there was, it was, there was sort of an intentional interdisciplinary blending of that. And again, this came, this, the college was founded in the 1950s uh, with the sort of awareness of, of nuclear weapons and atomic energy and all the stuff coming out of the post-Cold War, coming out of the Cold War environment. Uh, informing the creation of, of that college. Um, when I got uh, out, I, by my senior year, I'd realized that I was interested from this history of science stuff in uh, the politics of science. Why do people spend billions of dollars on a space station or, or a large superconducting super collider or things like this? How do societies make these kind of decisions? And um, I, had no, I didn't have time as a physics major to take stuff like this. So there was a program at MIT called the Technology and Policy Program, uh, which was, again, one of the first sort of blendings of uh, technology and science policy and science and decision making. Uh, and itself was created in the 70s in the kind of aftermath of the ecological movement, uh, kind of an inspiration through the Apollo picture of the Earth from Apollo 8, uh, which uh, sparked people thinking about the Earth as a holistic system. Uh, controversies over, this, over the supersonic transport, uh, controversies over nuclear energy per se. So all of these things, uh, which marked a change from the optimism, techno-optimism of the 60s, informed the creation of MIT's program, which then was really just kind of up and running in the late 70s when, when I wound up there. Um, and it was a great program, had a great time, and got double masters, both in uh, public policy and technology, as well as in aero engineering. 
being broke at that point and I needed to go earn a living, I went off into industry where I had no intention of ever really coming back into academia. The issues I dealt with in industry, though, uh, were uh, in the shuttle orbiter division out at Rockwell. So we were actually building orbiters, which are now, of course, now in museums. So again, make you feel old. Uh, but as we were building these things, it was very clear that decisions in space were driven by policy choices, not really by technology per se, or even economics in, in, in some instances. It really policy choice. Why are we doing this? And of course, the shocking discovery for a space enthusiast is that decisions in space are done for political reasons and not because space is cool and it's neat and it's human destiny and all the rest of that. Um, it's done for all kinds of, I see Kei Kazumi nodding back there. Yep. Yes, brother, we're, we're here. Um, okay, so um, realizing that, I went back uh, to, again, I would consider one of the motherlands of public policy, which is the RAND Corporation, uh, which has a large graduate program, this time, of course, in PhDs, and they still crank out a lot there. In fact, some of my students have been, have gone to RAND, uh, again, just to get their doctorates in public policy there. Um, so I've kind of descended from physics, engineering, and now uh, into public policy. Uh, wound up coming back to DC in 1990, about the time I guess Nick uh, got here. I had met John uh, actually in 82 at, uh, at MIT. Uh, so again, I think, B, B, I think it was at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, I remember you in Cambridge. Huh? There, okay. there is a Kendall Square. I, I, got, I, got a taxi I got a taxi cab for you. It was after a long dinner. Thank you. <laughs> I remember it. Um, but probably Air and Space Museum as well. Uh, so be nice to everybody you meet, because you never know, right, you know, when things come back. Um, anyway, the point of, of all this is that I, I wind up here in, in D.C., again, working in the Commerce Department of Space, but with this mixture of policy issues as well as, as, as technical stuff. And I, I have sort of a D.C. career. So I, I'm there. I come back out, go back to RAND. I wind up supporting OSTP during the Clinton administration. A bunch of space stuff happens. I work on the campaign for Bush 43. I go into OSTP this time as a political appointee. Uh, I go over to NASA, do that tour as a political appointee. Of course, and again, as a political appointee, you have an expiration stamp on your forehead, you know, do not use after this date. Um, and then wind up coming out uh, and there was an opening and competed for a position. Uh, John had been looking to retire for some time um, and was convincing me that the gig over here was worth competing for. Uh, and I did. Uh, so I came here as a professor of practice uh, in, uh, in 2008. So again, not only second generation in terms of uh, sort of leadership here in the Institute, second generation in terms of after the founding of the s and policy fields, uh, I went through the programs that were created by those initial uh, founders and then have been sort of shaping the programs uh, as they are today. Uh, the field has uh, kind of split from those early days. Uh, when I talk to students coming in now, uh, I'll make a distinction between s and policy and s and studies. So s and science, technology, and society programs that you'll see at many universities, um, to me, come more out of the um, anthropology, sociology, history uh, tradition, which, again, I did as a, as a minor. Um, earlier, uh, but the S&T policy community is kind of more out of an engineering tradition. Uh, economics, statistics, organizational theory, public policy analysis, you know, how do we go make something work rather than what is the meaning of this thing? It's rather about uh, how do I make something work? So those, those are two very different attitudes toward, uh, toward S&T. And in fact, uh, of course, I, as an ex-engineer and ex-physicist, physicist, find the s and policy world, you know, more, uh, more to my, my taking. Um, and I think it has been really striking to be here in the Elliott School um, because uh, while I have a secondary appointment with Trachtenberg, I love all the Trachtenberg people. Uh, they use the tools that I'm trained in, it's very familiar and so forth. And without any offense, they don't work on subjects that I'm interested in. Um, it's a very domestic policy oriented place. And so, but when there are people doing s and and defense kind of issues, you know, they come to us and, and come to Nick. So the topic areas, the subject matter areas that I care about are in the Elliott School. 
uh, the relationship of the United States to the rest of the world. How do we cooperate with others? Uh, the role of s and in economic growth and innovation, a much more globalized and a much more democratized world where many more players are in, uh, in this space. So the Elliott School as a subject matter fit is great, but I recognize the importance of the tools uh, and, and the traditions that are in the other fields. So we draw people from the economics department, we draw history department, political science, and of course, most importantly, the, the, the Trachtenberg School. This kind of relates to the charge that I got from Michael Brown, who was the dean here when I arrived uh, in 2008. And one of his admonitions was uh, to not isolate myself in the space ghetto and among just other sort of space people, but make sure that this was a university wide thing, kind of as John was saying, you know, James Webb's vision in the beginning of not being necessarily affiliated with a single school, but to reach out more broadly. And so like, that's what we've tried to do. Uh, not only ties with the Trachtenberg School, ties with the engineering school. Uh, we've had, uh, actually, I just sat on a dissertation uh, defense yesterday, uh, again, with one of our students who's then coming out of the PhD program in, in the engineering school, uh, the School of Medicine, uh, having an aerospace medicine course. Uh, ties to uh, the business school in terms of uh, analytics, uh, ties to, of course, economics and political science. You saw we recently hired, uh, again, a, uh, a, a new tenure track person, Aaron Bateman, who is going to be in the history department, and especially his Cold War history. Uh, and he comes out of, uh, out of uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, and, uh, uh, but was a former Air Force intelligence officer. Uh, so he's seen what public policy is. And so he's not merely sort of a historian, but he's also a public policy person. And so the theme that kind of comes over and over again is that people have their disciplinary foundations and backgrounds, but then by dint of the school and where we're located, this policy layer gets put on, on top. I sometimes get asked by undergraduates, like, I want to be a space policy major. And I'm like, no, you don't. No, you don't. Uh, first of all, you need to get your undergraduate degree in a disciplinary foundation, and, and it can be almost anything. It can be political science or economics, it can be physics. Uh, you need to have that disciplinary foundation. What we do here is a kind of a multidisciplinary layering on, and we try to level people up to a layer where they can translate and talk across multiple different policy communities. So if they've been a STEM person by background, that's great. Nothing wrong with that. I come out of that. But they need to learn federal budgeting. They need to learn organizational theory. They need to learn policy analysis. They need to learn to speak these other languages uh, that the community speaks. If they are in uh, a non-STEM background, like your international relations or political science, as, as Nick was showing uh, from the chart, we want people to take analytical courses uh, and we want to level them up such that they can hold a, a conversation, maybe not fluent, but Berlitz level at least, conversations with technical communities. Um, and so we do that. Uh, I'm sort of known in my second semester space policy class for terrifying the IR majors because they get um, problem set assignments that involve orbital transfer calculations. Um, it's mostly algebra, it's not that bad, but the first look of panic you know, on their faces is always precious. Um, and then after they do that, they realize that they, they can do this, they can uh, speak across these, these communities. So the, uh, and the, they then go on, I think, to do, uh, to do really great things. The topics that they're trained in are continuing to evolve and change. At the beginning of uh, this, before sort of arrived, uh, questions of S&T policy and history were about things like nuclear weapons and how do we you know, sort of live with that or nuclear energy and how do, we, how do we live with that? What is the role of government? How should decision be made for really big projects like, again, supersonic transport or environmental issues and, and so on? So role of government, what does government do? How does it do it? What does science technology play in that? Um, what we've seen uh, in more, uh, more recent years, that's all still there but it's becoming more the role of the private sector, role of NGOs, role of culture uh, in, in shaping what people choose to be in. It's not just a government decision-making um, in, in, in Congress or a bureaucracy uh, because the power of s and is spread much more widely. And in fact, many cases, the intellectual capital innovation in s and is not within the government. The government is trying to catch up or keep up uh, with what is going on 
uh, around it. And the expertise and leadership are not within the government, except in very, very specialized areas. Um, and so this brings up uh, the large, this brings up new technology questions for us today. So after space and nuclear, which are kind of like foundational, uh, now we, we worry about information technologies, wireless technologies, uh, biotech, synthetic biology, new advanced materials. You know, if you think about it at a, maybe at a physics level, again, very fundamentally, it's about the manipulation of energy, matter, and information. How do we manipulate atoms? How do we manipulate bits? How do we um, manipulate things that be, are since living organisms of various kinds? So life, atoms, energy, there's nothing sort of more fundamental, um, I think, than that. Uh, and if you don't speak uh, s and or at least have a familiarity with it, which, rep which these powers represent, um, you're kind of alone in the wilderness. Uh, you're, you're kind of out there kind of by yourself. So you're unarmed. And it's hard to be a true, I think, in my, again, biased opinion, be really a full citizen um, of your society unless, and participate in those decision makings, unless you have some familiarity thing. Doesn't mean you have to be a physicist, doesn't mean you're an engineer, but understanding some of these things out there that are shaping a society today. Lack of knowledge about that or understanding of how it works leads to problems of trust. And, and uh, I would emphasize today the issues of technical trust or lack thereof are just endemic. Uh, up and down. If, if in the beginning we had issues of trust over, can we trust those people with nuclear weapons? Can we trust the regulators for these nuclear, uh, for these energy uh, nuclear power plants? Today, we have issues of trust that are broader than that. Can I trust the algorithms uh, that are feeding the information? Uh, can I trust um, the, the regulators of, uh, say, spectrum uh, and wireless to operate, you know, in the public interest? Um, can I trust uh, the development of, uh, you know, vaccines? Can I trust the development of, you know, uh, new recombinant DNA techniques? Uh, can I trust how new generations of uh, energy will be created? So you have the normal governance issues, but then you have issues of who owns this technology, uh, where, where does that rely? And I think the public policy aspects that, uh, that we teach and work with uh, today uh, have become even more important, uh, not because we have the answers, um, but because we try to educate the next generation of students uh, who will become uh, leaders uh, who will grapple with these issues. Um, I'll close with a, uh, a comment made by uh, Secretary, uh, former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates. Uh, he went off to the University of Texas and, uh, and uh, was, uh, had a bunch of faculty there. And one of the questions the faculty asked him I'm paraphrasing was, you know, how come you, you know, high mucky muck policymakers don't come talk to real experts like us and ask us for advice because, you know, we know a lot. Um, I see Kay nodding back there. Okay. Um, and, uh, and his reply was, we don't have time. We're, we're doing stuff. We got stuff happening in us every day. Uh, we don't have time to go down and, and dive into that. If you want to have an impact, real impact on policy, uh, what you need to do is educate your students, uh, educate the people who will be in the seats in there uh, to have the perspectives, to have the knowledge, know where to go and get the knowledge, uh, because I don't have time. I, and my successors don't have time. But you can help by improving the quality of the people who are going to be in the room or outside the room uh, for shaping these issues. And that is your charge. Um, as, as academics in the university. And that is, I think that is our charge for the next generation, next 50 years of, uh, of S&T policy at, uh, at the Elliott School. Thanks. Uh, the, 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 the question came up uh, from John, why, why in international affairs? And I, I, I given this this is a very very diverse field I, I want to show you what's happening now what i'm working on so the geopolitical issues uh, that you know are going on in eastern europe in eastern asia we have disagreements and as a result of all those there is a massive reorganization of international investment massive right now 
and 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 that um, uh, clearly affects technological development. Clearly, will affect innovation. Clearly, will, uh, will affect the positioning of developing countries into these so-called global value chains. Because no product any any longer is 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 being produced by one company or in one uh, location. None whether that is a service or a real product like, like, like this one, um, uh, nothing. So, um, we are organizing uh, right now a big conference down in Brazil. So countries like Brazil are very much in this question. Um, in, in this new environment, um, and and, and uh, at the University of Campinas, I have a secondary appointment, as some of you know. Um, we are we are putting together a conference um, on uh, global value chains and regional uh, innovation ecosystems. So regions and how they relate to international and how this, this reorganization of investment might uh, uh, hurt some of them or might help some of them. Uh, it, is a, it, it has a lot to do with technology, with innovation, but it's not technology. Um, so, so a program like ours in the School of International Affairs, I think, positioned in, in, in tackling issues like this, um, just is a, or a chemistry problem or an engineering problem. Uh, but all of this is part of it. Um, we can go into discussion if we have some time. Scott, do you have questions? Uh, I, I've got, I've got a, a few uh, backlog of people do have questions. They can ask them here uh, in person or if they're online. Uh, there's a Q&A section uh, on, uh, on Zoom that I'm seeing. So anybody who's uh, out there in virtual space, please just send them in. If anybody's here, just uh, as a question, raise your hand and Christine will, uh, will respond with the, with the mic. Uh, but let's go to a question, a discussion first. Sure. I, will, I wanted to add another dimension of the evolution of the program, uh, which is that, and I think it's true across the Elliott School, uh, we host a lot of visitors for long, longer or shorter periods, and it adds a texture and a dimension to the program that wouldn't otherwise be there. Uh, and, and, you know, one could go down the list, but over 50 years, there have been a lot of people that have spent a few weeks, a few months, a few years uh, with us, uh, enriching the program, interacting with our students. Uh, and and uh, I think that's one of the things that, that, you know, we have the comparative advantage of our location. So, so people overseas want to come and be near the seat of power, uh, which is either here or a couple of blocks down the street. Uh, uh, and and, and I, I think the welcoming uh, of uh, the, the school to that kind of international uh, and domestic, uh, we've had foreign service officers come and spend a year with us, uh, for example, has been, I think, one of the uh, distinguishing fact, uh, features of our school and our program. Uh, just want, wanted to stick this in to make sure it got on the record. I uh, have been in contact over the past couple of days with one of our alumna uh, who uh, would, would like to have come, but couldn't. Why couldn't he? He's busy running to be the president of Paraguay. Uh, so we could have the first president. Uh, we've had administrators or deputies or, or whatever, but it'd be cool to have an alum that was a president. Uh, Alyssa, this, this man was 10 years ago, one of the distinguished Elliott School alumni, his name's Martin Burke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, say, I'm, I, I think it's kind of cool that we have, I have no idea, this is going far afield now, stop quickly. I have no idea 
whether he's a dark horse, whether he's a leading candidate, he's been a kind of career uh, social entrepreneur in and out of politics in Paraguay. And I don't know whether he's, he's someone that has a chance or not. Uh, anyway. I would kind of going off of that. Um, what's been really, I think, interesting about the pandemic uh, you know, first we all kind of you know shifted radically online uh, to do that and 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 deal with it, remote teaching and so forth. And of course, visitors and things have dropped off. Um, and hopefully, as we're coming out of it, is sort of interesting sort of lessons learned. Uh, on one hand, the tools, uh, the technical tools that were developed response, uh, I think have been great, and I think we want to keep it. So. Uh, if I have students who have to go to a launch, that's a real thing for our students, um, then, uh, you know, missing class is not a big deal. A lot of them work, virtually all of them work. So sometimes work comes in and they've got to go do things. And so having your lectures recorded or having them available uh, is a massive convenience. They don't, don't lose, um, they don't lose a step. On the other hand, it's also stressed how important the in-person stuff is. I'm still somewhat bothered by I can't see faces even by students in class. When a student takes off their mask to talk, I'm always struck by, wow, what a face. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a different person. Um, and the visitors, as John talks about, uh, lead to the um, personal exchanges that really can't be duplicated virtually. You know, it's the old saying, we, we meetings are lousy for exchanging data, but they're for exchanging emotions. Um, and uh, having people present here, it just has a quality um, all of its own. Um, you know, universities are somewhat medieval institutions. Uh, they were created for long, long history reasons. They are a different social structure than say a corporation or a military service or a government or things like that. Um, and part of that, uh, aspect uh, stemming from the Middle Ages of these long communities and then correspondence with others who share uh, kind of intellectual interest, even if they're, they're far away. I think we've uh, had a hand in creating an s and community and a space community in particular, um, but an s and community that does span uh, much broader than uh, just our own institution here, which is, you know, was, was, was kind of the point, but that the importance of this kind of personal uh, contact and engagement shows this is still very much a human endeavor. This is not something that can be done by, you know, algorithms or at distance. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope uh, that we don't have to practice this pandemic stuff too much uh, anymore, but uh, we may, and we still have some hopefully better tools to deal with it. That may, uh, thank you. That makes a very nice uh, segue to what I was going to say. Uh, Al Teich, I'm a former um, facu full-time faculty here, then I was at AAAS, and now I'm back here as a research professor. Um, and one of the things that put this program on the map for me, and I think created the help, helped to create the kind of community that Scott just mentioned, uh, is, are the uh, seminars that uh, John pioneered that used to be, I don't know, what once a month, something like that, in, uh, at, uh, initially at Adam's Rib, a restaurant on 21st in Pennsylvania. And um, after that, it moved around a bit. But it was a, t I, I was a, a faculty at, uh, up in a, upstate New York, and I would come in for these things when I could. I would time my visits to Washington because they were really an opportunity to meet the Washington science policy community and to find out what was going on and to make those kinds of personal contacts that were very important in establishing an s and policy community. And uh, John may want to say a little bit more about the history of that of those seminars, but I think they were a really important contribution of the program uh, uh, in the earlier days. I wouldn't call them seminars, Al, because they were dinners with a lot of wine being drunk. <laughs> were, uh, to me, they were called the Logsdon seminars. Yeah, well, good. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the uh, advantages that we have here 
is kind of a convening authority, that this is a good place to bring communities together. Uh, and, and we've done that in general science and technology policy, not only through the evening dinners, but afternoon sessions, uh, uh, symposia, colloquia. Uh, symposia, I think, is coming together to drink, uh, is a translation. Um, anyway, uh, but the point is, is valid. We have used our convening authority to help create communities in the areas that we work in, uh, build connections, uh, en enrich ourselves, uh, and, 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 and bring to the university uh, a, a range of people of uh, background and character and position uh, that, that is really uh, uh, gratifying to be the able to, to mobilize that kind of uh, uh, in, engagement with what we're doing, I guess is the best way to say it. A few more minutes. Okay, well, uh, there is, uh, I, this question seems kind of anonymous, so we'll, we'll see uh, if someone recognizes it. Um, but a, a question of who, what have been the characteristics? Are there any common characteristics of students who've wound up coming here um, uh, and what makes for a successful or less successful student um, when they're attracted and, and come into this, this business. Because again, we're not a, you know, we're not like a, a classic thing of, you know, you know, pre-law or or even engineering or so forth. This is kind of a, a weird thing. So what is, are there any patterns? Have you seen anything in students over the years that make you go, oh, this person's going to do great or Mm, well, we'll see. Let me start with a kind of prior question. How do we get the students here? Uh, you know, who do you advertise to? Uh, since, since we are multidisciplinary, kind of a niche topic, although a very important niche, we have struggled over the years of how to communicate that there is this kind of function at GW and that people can come and study with us. Uh, I think the distinguishing characteristic of the students, the successful students, is intellectual curiosity, is, is a, uh, a, a, se a sense that they uh, are interested in the issues we're dealing with. They don't come to be policy analysts. I think they come to deal with science and technology space issues in a setting that is policy oriented. I mean, one of the things that's attractive is that you don't have to have a technical background to do our program. It helps. I think there's a comparative advantage uh, if you have a prior technical background, but it's certainly not necessary. We've had uh, graduates who were theater people, uh, artists, uh, writers, uh, in, in addition to uh, lapsed engineers, uh, I mean, you'll hear Rich Lesner this afternoon, uh, is, who's one of my uh, memories of being someone that had a good engineering degree and then found out he'd rather do the policy dimensions. It's kind of what Scott did uh, in, in his career and indirectly kind of what I did. My first degree was in physics. You've always been an economist, right? <laughs> I'm still an economist. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we had another question, and I don't know if you tell me this is the last one, or, last um, one, yeah. um, but we had uh, a question from uh, uh, one of our friends actually coming in from Germany, um, talking about, uh, uh, you know, future program areas, particularly uh, life sciences, global health uh, policies with uh, implications for S&T and, and innovation. Um, uh, you know, Nick, you mentioned, uh, of course, the desire to, uh, to add, add some more faculty to replace uh, ones we have lost, of course, always an agenda for a department. Um, but uh, would you prioritize uh, research public scholarship on the themes of, of uh, life sciences, global health, or is that already being covered by other parts of the university? What might we do differently or uniquely? Yeah, thank you. Um, very important question. Of course, uh, we, are, we are all the time thinking about 
these these kinds of things. I think there is there is no question that that the the information technology field broadly defined is is a huge priority uh, because simply it it, it it has gone everywhere. Uh, any any sector, any part of the economy is is uh, hugely affected by it. So, um, in the next round of hiring, if there is um, one, I think probably we will go for that. Um, um, we've lost a very important person in cybersecurity, um, uh, uh, who Professor Farrell, who went to Johns Hopkins, and and I think we may want to to replace uh, someone like 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 him. Um, um, uh, of course, uh, biology uh, remains extremely important, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the university has a very good medical school, and, and we try to double up with, with them uh, if, if we can. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the program, more generally, has been driven has been driven really by the demand and the fashions. I, I have been here long enough to remember the applications as they came in uh, throughout the decades. And, and indeed, um, <clears throat> um, it, was, uh, it, 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 it goes from IT in the late uh, uh, 1990s. It was huge uh, IT. Then we had the bubble uh, breaking up. Um, uh, and and then the 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 the, the wars uh, starting with the Middle East, and then there was a huge uh, change in the applications um, in security, and now we are back into IT, and now we have we have uh, artificial intelligence, cyber, and and all this. We have space, very important, very important component of our applications. Um, so so it's 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 really I can see the security component also. Um, um, rising again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's the sort of an interesting separate discussion about um, not only why do students get into a certain field because they read the news and they see what's sort of happening. So we have a lot of students, for example, interested in commercial space because that's out there and happening. Um, but there's then kind of a, a, a farther back question, um, uh, the theory of that uh, what uh, shapes people's perceptions of the future, and this is more into the s and studies areas, is what kind of science fiction do they read when they're teenagers? If you, uh, in many cases uh, in the space field, people will read sort of classic 50s and 60s science fiction with rocket ships and so forth, which in many ways is kind of an older technology. I mean, yes, there's always improvements. And then you went through a generation of, you know, cyberpunk novels and talking about IT and synthetic biology, and that becomes interesting. So people, there's kind of a, uh, I'm getting out of my policy realm here, but there's an interaction with sort of the arts and literature and what people envision about what society ought to be that then, and what the role of technology plays in that, that then sparks people to go, I'm interested in studying STEM, or I'm interested in studying the impacts of s and on other areas. So we look at the immediate applications, but then you look farther back in the culture and go, what are people thinking about next? And so again, energy, environment, climate is a big issue uh, sort of for the future. Uh, so anyway, we have these interesting conversations with our other colleagues around the, around the university about what is it that's driving students here? So, so um, about a year ago uh, with a couple of other people, we published a, a really a very long paper, more than a hundred pages on, on the evolution of the field and, and, and of, um, of uh, the, 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 the thinking in this field and, and the different disciplines that, that, that have uh, actually influenced the, this field. And, and what we learned ourselves actually, first of everybody, is that uh, the, the people who write and influence the field have moved. Um, they used to be in economics department. If you if you go back to the big names in this field, uh, Nathan Rosenberg, Dick Nelson, uh, people like this, they started from econ departments or sociology departments. Um, there is a massive flight of, of people, of influencers in the field in business schools, right? Which surprises uh, people. Now, business schools have, uh, have the vast majority of thinkers in this field. Uh, and there is a there is a, a, a sort of a surprise by people, but it's very easily explained. This now, if you look at the at the publication that Jenny used to to publish at NSF uh, about the expenditures on research and development in the United States, you will see that at least three quarters of those expenditures 
and of, of, of those who carry out this research is the private sector. Uh, the private sector is moving this field. Um, so, so what are they interested in? They are interested in innovation. They, they, they really couldn't care less about science and technology. They do it because they need the innovations, because they need the money to, to, go, to be competitive, right? Now, that is a whole different mindset uh, than, than the, the, the more... Um, uh, philosophical and <laughs> that there was very, it's a very driven towards innovation so um, the literature actually if if now people ask me to write this or the other paper uh, always I will I will tell them to to look at the business literature and to give you a specific example the number one um, um, journal in our field it's not my journal, it's somebody else's journal. Uh, uh, but uh, the number one journal, which is research policy, is the oldest journal, is the most influential. This is where uh, everybody looks first to find ideas. It's actually in the top 50 of the Financial Times. It is top journal in all the, the, the business schools around the world. So, so the journal itself has changed dramatically. It's much more technical, much more business, much more uh, innovation oriented, um, but it is still the, the, the place where the people from our field want to publish. Um, it's a 2% a acceptance rate, 2%. Um, so if you put a, a paper in research policy, people will read it. Um, uh, and, and, and that's the field, I, I, I give this as an example, the field is, has changed very much. Very. Yeah, um, uh, that's exactly. Thank you. I think we should, we should close here and invite the next panel. Um, I think there's supposed to be a 10 minute break. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and then there will be a longer break. And Evan will join us. Evan is right there. Um, <clears throat> I think we could we could go right through it. Uh, um, so, 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 so this is uh, uh, the second panel for today. Um, we may hear some something more interesting than history, uh, <laughs> than just history. Right? Uh, um, um, these are, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is this is when we thought about this event, we 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 really wanted to to structure it around the, our uh, alumni. And from now on, you will hear only from alumni, basically, um, uh, and some faculty, and some faculty, but few. Um, <clears throat> so, so in this panel, um, we, have, um, we have a few distinguished uh, people. We have Jennifer Bond right here. Um, Jennifer is, 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 is currently the senior fellow, uh, senior fellow at the Council of Competitiveness, but I think uh, most people, older people like myself, uh, remember Jennifer as uh, the, 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 the important person that was publishing for many, many years, the science and engineering indicators. Um, uh, this most well-known publication of the National Science Foundation here. Um, then we have uh, Rich, uh, 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 next to Jennifer, we have uh, Rich Leschner, and he is, uh, he is a vice president of consulting at Bryce Tech. You have, you have, you have already their bios. 
And then next to Rich, we have uh, Michelle, Michelle Garfinkel. Um, Michelle Garfinkel is, uh, is coming to us from Europe, um, where for many years, he, she's, she has been uh, the manager for science policy program at the uh, European Molecular Biology um, um, uh, Lab uh, in Germany, in Heidelberg. Um, Michelle was, uh, was one of these uh, 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 people uh, who uh, we did not mention earlier, but, but actually there are several of them who come to the program with a PhD. So they earn a good PhD somewhere else in some discipline. Uh, uh, and then they come to the program to become, to, uh, and they always ask me, why should I take a, a master's now that I have a PhD? Um, uh, and, and, and that is an interesting, interesting discussion. So she had a, a PhD really from, from a very good university. University of Washington, and, and she was a very accomplished uh, um, um, uh, a professional, and then she joined the program. And finally, on the screen, we have Evan, Evan Mickelson, uh, who, 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 who joined the program um, several years back, of course, and since then she graduated from, uh, from our program with, uh, with top grades. Uh, he did his PhD in public policy at NYU, actually, the Wagner School, and now he's program director uh, at the Sloan Foundation. He's joining us today from, uh, from New York. So without further ado, I will, I will pass it on to you guys, uh, give a little introduction, and, and, and then we can have a beautiful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, um, and thank you for inviting me to this um, celebration. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. I wanted to say from the beginning that I think without this program, most, most if not all of the many opportunities and adventures I've been able to have in my career would not have been possible, really was the foundation for a lot of the um, things that I got to do. So I graduated from Stanford in 1970. And I, although I'd been at Stanford in France and Europe, I really wanted to come to Washington and my um, major focus was in international, but I started being interested also in science and technology policy and how that was changing, um, how technology is changing the world. So I applied to um, GW and was in the international or in SBIA, but I um, needed to go home to Tucson for a year to help my family and I, worked for the Chamber of Commerce, including the Rodeo Committee. And um, they, um, GW called and they said, oh, we've noticed in your, you know, your background that you had a lot of science in high school and Stanford. And we had this new program maybe you would be interested in, in science and technology policy. So I said, yes, I would be, you know, love that. So I was in one of the first classes. But um, John Logston was, I got to be the uh, research associate for him. And as he said, he was so nice to offer. I think he thought it was kind of, this is my first time to be in Washington. He knew I'd never been here. And maybe I was a tiny bit naive. So he offered to pick me up at the airport. But at that time, I thought I'm going to be there a year. And I wanted to bring my cowboy hat and boots, but they're hard to pack. So I decided to wear them on the plane. So I get off the plane and John is going, Jennifer, Jennifer Bond. <laughs> and I came running over to him and I said, how did you recognize me? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's a wild guess. But um, anyway, it was so nice. And then he actually drove me at that time, you could drive in front of the Lincoln Monument. So on the way back into the city, he drove me in front of there and I thought, my heart was pounding. I'm in Washington, DC. I'd always wanted to come here. And so I think one of the advantages of the program, the really important advantage is it's very multidisciplinary and flexible. That you, you can um, really fashion your own um, program. And as Nick said, you can still do that. Um, one of my, we saw on the screen, the picture of John Hanessian was one of my professors for international science and technology policy. And he invited 
the director of the Brazilian Space Research Institute, Dr. Fernando de Mendoza, Dr. Mendoza was testifying before Congress on a tech transfer bill. And um, he, he came, and this is one of the advantages that we said, being here in Washington, um, professors can invite policymakers and all kinds of people, international diplomats, et cetera. So it's really an advantage, I think. So after Dr. Mendoza talked about NP and what they were doing, it's both basic research and applied. And I thought it sounds so fascinating. So afterwards I had the, um, the nerve to ask him, do you ever hire foreigners? And he said, well, oh, yes, occasionally I should contact him. And um, so I actually did. And he decided he should start a science policy unit at the Space Research Institute because he was very good about anticipating what the Brazilian government might be interested in funding and um, start a program. So I went down there, was there for two years, and eventually that science policy program evolved into their um, CNPQ, which is like NSF. And um, so that was, and it was wonderful. I'm still friends with a lot of the people there. But I just want to say for the students, don't be afraid to ask for um, what, you, what, what your imagination is and always be aware of opportunities. Um, coming back from Brazil, I, um, oh, so I wanted to mention, I did my thesis on the Soviet approach to the scientific and technological revolution at that time you had to do both comprehensive and a thesis, although they were moving that maybe a thesis wasn't totally necessary, but I think it's important to have that writing component. But I was almost done with my thesis. And also I had been able to do a third year law class, environmental law. So that was another way of being flexible, I think, in the program. Um, when, so I was pretty much done. So I thought, well, I'm going to Brazil. But at that time in the middle ages, it was, you had to do your thesis on special typing paper. And there could not be any um, corrections on any page. So I took a whole bunch of this typing paper down to Brazil, but then I had to find someone um, who could type. It was a good typist, but knew English too. And I did finally find someone, but then she moved to Brazilia. Um, and another kind of weird thing was John and I had Carl Logston, I mean, Carl Linden was one of my other professors. They had a particular question about one of my references, which my mom had to send that down to me. And it had, it had communism in the title and it actually turned out that it, it, I was waiting for it for months. It turned out it had been diverted to Chile because they were at that point um, flirting with communism, socialism and in Brazil, it was all the military junta. They didn't want to have this kind of literature there. So, but at last I got it and was able to take my um, thesis to the, to the US Embassy in Rio to put in their pouch because mail was not so secure. So the lesson from that is go ahead and finish what you're doing before you go off onto another adventure. That's my, that's my um, goal. But anyway, coming back from Brazil, I um, interviewed with the Academy and I got a job working on one of their committees for uh, remote sensing in developing countries because Brazil had a big remote sensing program. And so as that was finishing up, I was able to have on the very same day an offer to do a project for the World Bank and also go to MIT in their, um, in their science and technology policy area. So I told MIT, oh, I would be so much more valuable to them if they would let me do this World Bank um, project. And so they did. And um, then, I went up to MIT and they did, a, they were doing as Nick said, innovation policy was becoming very important. And um, we worked on a six country study of innovation policy. And about the time we were finishing up, um, John Logson called me and said, um, 
The National Science Foundation is looking for an international science policy person to work on their international chapter of science and engineering indicators. And you should apply. So I did, and they actually gave me the job. And um, as Nick said, that's been my major career was in, I became the director of the science and technology. I mean, the science and engineering indicators um, report that goes every two years to the president and the Congress. And um, that's been, I think, my major um, contribution, I would say. And, and we had to keep up with new issues, but we wanted to be very objective as well. And so um, one of the things that's important, I think, for students is it's, I do think you have to have quantitative skills. Um, it's not just about policy. It's important to have data and quantitative skills, especially nowadays. Um, but as part of that, I got to represent the United States at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris. And we had our um, national experts in science and technology policy um, indicators and then a nesty group. And that was a wonderful experience. And I'm still in touch with most of the other representatives. I used to say, someone has to sacrifice for their country, might as well be me to get to travel to <laughs> Paris and many other countries. We expanded it to Asia and also um, Latin America. Um, I was a NSF is very flexible also. It's almost in between um, a government and university environment. So they're very positive about doing details, almost like sabbaticals. And um, I was able to go to the White House on OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and um, work for Dr. D. Allen Bromley there in, on um, big science was starting to be very important. And we knew that we could only do that with international cooperation. That was a priority for Dr. Bromley. But also he felt the importance of personal relations. We had talked about that. And so he had invited the top R&D performing countries to send their, their advisor, um, presidential advisor to Mount Kisco for really in, in person and informal um, discussions about the issues they're facing and what are some solutions. And, um, and then he said, then it was up to me. He decided he should be, um, you know, he should reciprocate and go to Europe. But the only problem was he decided he was going to go in August. And you all know that most Europeans are not in their office in August. So I had to convince each of the science advisors that they should come back to their office to meet with him, which I did. And so everything, I did all the background, the issues, et cetera. And now it's only time to decide where is he going to stay? And he goes, um, he said, well, you know, I'm used to staying in some of the nicest hotels, but I can't do that on the regulations, government regulations and budget. And of course I piped up in my little voice. I said, well, Dr. Bromley, I know some really charming hotels in Paris. And he looks at me sternly and he said, Jennifer, I'm not into charm, I'm into comfort. I think I will. <laughs> I think I'll ask the White House travel agency to, to arrange that. And so he went and it was, the, it was a horrible heat wave. People were literally dying. And he called back and he said, everything, all the quantitative data, all of the arrangements and the discussions are great, but none of the hotels have air conditioning and we're sweating like pigs. So I was like, thank goodness I didn't give anything, anything to the hotels. I also got to um, do a detail later with the Senate, with Senator Joe Lieberman and Bill Von Billion that you're going to hear from later was a legislative director and I worked there for two years and that was very fascinating um, to be there. And at that time, after, soon after I got there, Al Gore picked um, Senator Lieberman to be his vice presidential um, nominee. And um, we got to, we strictly were regulated to do only Senate business during the day, but at nighttime we could volunteer and I worked on 
on issues task force. And of course, we also had the excitement of having the anthrax um, attack and the 7-Eleven attack. So that was a very amazing time. I then worked with the Council on Competitiveness. Deborah Wint Smith was the, um, became the president and she and I were colleagues at the National Science Foundation and that the council had sort of narrowed their agenda over the years. And she wanted me to start an international initiative with the council. And so I was able to be there and I am uh, still a fellow with the council. So um, now I'm back in my hometown of Tucson and I'm retired. But as my great niece says, you're not really retired because you're busy doing <laughs> all kinds of things. I am where I'm on the advisory committee of the University of Arizona WISE program, Women in Science and Engineering, and the president of a, um, a foundation to help my high school, which now has like 35 nations represented and needs a, a lot of help. And, and of course, I'm Stanford alumni. So many, many activities, but I just wanted to say, I'm very proud and grateful for having an exciting career and feeling like you make an impact. And, um, but that wouldn't be possible if I hadn't had my master's in this wonderful program. So I wanna thank all of my friends, mentors, teachers, and, uh, and friends. I think Jean Johnson's here from the Science Indicators Committee too. So it's wonderful to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi everybody. I'm I'm Rich Leshner, and uh, I came to the program um, early in my in my professional career. I had gotten a master's degree in aeronautics and astronautics at Stanford. Uh, circumstances in my personal life brought me to the East Coast, and I was working for a Beltway Bandit uh, CETA contractor uh, on ballistic missile defense programs, which very shortly after I started uh, got canceled. And I was kibitzing with a friend and said, "Man." How'd that happen? I got a job and then I lost a job. Now I didn't get fired, but I didn't have a lot of work to do for a little while. And that person was a fellow, now fellow um, uh, graduate of the program, a gentleman named Thor Hogan, who's a professor at Earlham College in the Midwest. And he said, well, you know, there's this, you could learn a little bit more about that at this program they have at GW if you wanted to check it out. And I did check it out. And I chose to do the PhD program, which was, um, run by then the Columbian School, now the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration. Um, but it curricula wise in science and technology policy was very much a joint effort between the Elliott School and uh, then the Columbian School. And um, I did the PhD for a lot of personal reasons, but I'm so glad I did because I had to take all of the coursework to get an a master's in public policy and public administration, and all of the coursework to get a master's degree in science and technology policy with a focus on space policy, all at the same time. I had to do two qualifying exams, although I guess that's the standard, but a qualifying exam for the core curriculum and a qualifying exam for the science and technology policy curriculum. And all of that exposure to re really taught me one fundamental lesson, which is the world is not the way you think it is. Specifically, I took a series of classes on microeconomics and macroeconomics and all neoclassical economic theory. And then this guy named Bob Rycroft, who was a professor for a long time, was like, none of that is true. That's a bunch of crap. Here's all this complexity theory stuff that you need to learn if you really want to understand how the world works. Um, now, not weighing in on the debate between that you know, or the debate between like Bayesian statistics and other kinds of statistics, the point is there's more than one way to look at the world. And learning about how to think that way on top of an engineering degree has been the most important foundational element of education for me as I've proceeded through my career. I worked um, as a research assistant for the Space Studies Board, convening academics who certainly don't see the world the same way, even if they're professors of the same subject. I then went to work for Scott actually at the, uh, what was then NASA's Office of Program Analysis and Evaluation and did that for a while. I worked at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and, and we certainly at the time um, implemented, uh, had a worldview that says the space policy world is not the world you think it is uh, and should be something else. And uh, I would argue that we were right. Um, and uh, I went, then I went to a startup 
uh, and and uh, that had a focus on small satellites, and and we were saying that the the world is not the way you think it is, and and we'll see if we prove that proves to be right. Uh, and now I'm I'm a consultant, and my primary job is to help people keep thinking about how to respond to the way the world is changing. Uh, and I I don't think I would have had that without the diversity of um, the perspectives and education that I got from the two sort of interlaying tracks of of classwork and, and project work that I did at the combination of the Trachtenberg School and the Elliott School. The other thing that I really want to stress in terms of um, being a graduate of the program, it's, it, you know, it's one of these things that I didn't think I would ever, first of all, I never thought I'd be in a position to give people in their 20s advice about anything, but people keep asking me, so I keep talking to them. And I never thought I would be saying this thing that sounds cliche, but it's so true, is that Yes, you want to go to a quality school because it will give you a quality education. But by the time you're doing a master's degree, and certainly by the time you're doing a PhD, it's as much about the people you're going to meet, the network you're going to create, the community you're going to belong to as a result of going to that institution as it is anything else. Because, you know, we all read the same books when it comes to figuring out incrementalism or rational choice theory. Um, and the community has never been something that um, I've never been more grateful to be a part of, in particular, because um, it's not something that you can always be actively engaged in, right? When I uh, was, had the good fortune to turn my PhD into a book, I, Scott, you were working at the White House, and I went to Scott, and I was like, hey, this is going to happen, and I would really like an opportunity to be able to sort of work with the, show it off to the students and have some you know, be able to make a thing, formal alumni, writing a book, big deal. And then the company I was working at, we decided we were going to make an acquisition of another company. And I was on point to lead that acquisition. And then, oh yeah, this book thing got published, but I'm entirely too busy with that. Right. And so, but a handful of years later, the community is still there. And I've been able to re-engage with Scott and think about how the company I'm at now can support the program and maybe come back and lecture from time to time. And the community never goes away. It's always there for you. It's always available. And it's always generating these really capable and smart people who, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to pull from and hire for what I do now um, and can just re-engage with at any time. It's really in that regards very much like a family. And because you step away from the academic part for so long, the ability to tap back into those resources reminds you if you needed reminding that the world isn't the way you think it is and you need to keep thinking creatively. So I'm, I'm super grateful in, in more ways that I can really express, although I gave it a shot, for the quality of the education, the quality of the professors, the quality of the relationships that I established, the community that I was able to participate in, and the way all of that created a foundation that launched me on this trajectory that when I look back, I, I couldn't be more pleased with, with not only where I've ended up so far, but really all of the steps that I was able to take along the way. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's okay with that. Yeah. Great. Um, so I'm Michelle Garfinkel and um, I was in the class starting 1998. So right around time of much change in many ways, um, I really distinctly remember um, the, the early part of, of being here in what at the time was CISTP and the first sort of cornerstone class in which um, Nick and John Logsdon and as well Robert Rycroft attended on the first day. We didn't really see them together again after that. And I, I remember very distinctly John Logsdon um, having said, you know, you, you don't actually need to know anything about um, any uh, science topic in order to do, to do well in this program. And I, I remember thinking that that was like my one bit of added value. And now I, I don't really know what to, uh, what to do. But um, as you see, I ended up here. It all worked out fine. I wanna give you a sense of, of how that worked out. Um, I want to just start by noting that this really is quite an honor to be here when I, I think about particularly the classes, you know, few ahead and a few behind me. I think we could have picked anybody out of there randomly and they could equally be on this panel. So I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm representing 
but just to say that, that we came of an era where um, the things that were talked about earlier and from Scott and, and Nick and John um, about people having curiosity or wanting to make the world a better place or making technology policy more open and inclusive. I think this was really all going on then. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanna say that um, a few years ago, I was partially responsible for putting together the 50th anniversary celebration at the European Molecular Biology Organization, where um, I, I currently head the policy program. And so I really appreciate how difficult um, that is, right? The, the logistics are, are an important thing. And Christine, of course, did a great job with this, but also thinking about how to get people here and what these panels are. So I, again, I really appreciate what went into this. Um, as, as Nick mentioned, I, I did have a PhD before and I could um, tell you a story and I do sometimes tell this story about how I got from there to here in a very linear fashion. Um, those of you skilled in certain parts of statistics would probably actually recognize that as harking, hypothesizing after the result is known. Um, so I won't try to give that specific story, but to say that I had always really been interested in politics, which I think we all sort of have the name for, but also policy, but I didn't know at the time that that was the name for it. And so for a number of reasons, I did not want to carry on um, with uh, research coming out of my doctoral work, um, but tried to think about how to take the skills I had gotten from that and through a very long and convoluted um, pathway ended up um, in this program. Uh, just conversationally, I'll mention that my PhD was in fact in microbiology and more specifically in RNA virology. So even though I did not carry on in that, it's sort of paid off now a little bit. Uh, it's uh, happy to answer those questions after. Um, what I wanted to do just in a couple of minutes is not really for the purpose of reviewing the path, but in thinking about the things that I had learned from the program and how I applied them in my roles. So while I was in the program, I was actually also working at the AAAS. Um, at the time, both Al and Kay were there. It's so nice to see um, both of them here. And again, this was the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, and very much a, a golden era there. We all think our own era is the golden era, but, but it really was amazing at that time. And I was able to do work in um, the scientific freedom, responsibility, and law program, which are areas that actually, again, to this day, I really work on. And my lesson from the GW program there was really about the internationality of, of uh, policy and science and technology. Um, although the work I did was mostly domestic, I had not really thought that through before. So even while I was still in the program, I was really able to apply that at AAAS. Um, I went on then to the Center for Science Policy and Outcomes, which is now the Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes down the street from, from Jennifer. Um, and there, what we were really thinking about was, was how are we serving public priorities or are we serving public priorities? How do we set public priorities? Um, as Scott mentioned, there are these intersections between science and technology studies and science policy research and analysis particularly. And it was there especially that I really felt that. Um, we also really pulled on a lot of the classical innovation theory and I remember thinking about, you know, who are these economists and engineers, but it really, really helped in the work. Um, I mean, basically to this day, I probably mentioned Semitech once a week and try to pull lessons from that. Um, these days I have to explain it a little more detail, but, um, but it's really a useful example. And I, I just remember being struck by that. Um, I then went to the J. Craig Venture Institute where I was the policy analyst working on synthetic biology. So again, these new areas that become more important 
um, sometimes over time, you can see it slowly, and sometimes they come almost out of nowhere, even to the people who are working in it. And that, to a degree, is what had happened here. And what really crystallized for me was the mechanisms, um, a lot of which we learned through, again, the George Washington programs, some of it which came from the Office of Technology Assessment. My boss there at the time had come out of the OTA. And again, the issues that were on the previous panel about meeting in person and working through these issues. Um, and again, this is something that I think we're all really feeling um, with the pandemic issues. And now again, why I'm very happy to be here, but this is how we you know, sort of change um, both feelings and in some cases data. Um, so finally, now I'm at the European Molecular Biology Organization. Um, this is a, basically it's a non-governmental organization that conducts work as um, uh, in order to fulfill the remit of the European Molecular Biology Conference, which is our member nations. So we have 30 member nations. This is approximately the same as the members of the EU. We gain a few, we lose a few, um, but basically now serving many, many nations under a European concept. And what I call on from the George Washington program every day in my work there, and again, we're, we are all very expert in this, so we see the nuance, but just roughly the idea that policy is about expanding options and politics is about narrowing options. And this is something where, um, where I came in partially with the understanding of my director at the time that this was a distinction that actually was not that clear for Europe. So you see a lot of the issues that come out again, Scott alluded to those um, partially domestically, but you see that in Europe also, the issues around strong opinions carrying the day rather than the analysis. And so again, it was not to say I went there in any way to try to solve this problem, but to try to help EMBO in having our corner of the world where we would do this work. Um, I'm really, um, happy to be able to say that one of the people um, on my direct staff is in fact another graduate of this program, Vidnakala, um, who was here about 10 years ago and is working in engagement. So how we bring in people more into our, our programs. Um, I really wanted to, to end sort of by thinking about the new issues coming up. Um, there are really systemic issues. Um, Evan and I, in fact, have interacted on several of these issues around open science and research assessment, right? These are all very sort of research policy issues. Um, a lot of this is going to change very quickly. And again, I think that the sort of facility that we picked up in this program is, is really very, very helpful. It all comes back again to that concept we talked about earlier of trust, right? Who makes these decisions? Who are the experts? This is really what I'm, I'm sort of thinking about every day now. Um, for people coming up, I think about um, not only is it that we learned science policy or technology policy, or now I work in research policy, but on the thematics as well. So a lot of what falls into research policy in for EMBO and our community actually is really more like labor policy, but actually I feel comfortable doing that even though I wasn't trained in it, not because I have any special insight, but because I have the tools to apply to that. And I really think this is one of the things that is great about that this program. And I really wanted to sort of capture that just by ending by saying that in preparing for this, I went back and looked at some old documents and, and some reporting from the time. And I was really struck by um, basically just a sentence in Louis Mayo's obituary. And this was actually from the, the Washington Post, so it was carried at the time. Um, there's a passage um, regarding his naming of the president um, or uh, naming as vice president of policy studies and um, this was, um, you know, his capacity until he retired. It goes on at some length about his other roles. 
the job involved defining and analyzing policy issues. And I really, this is exactly how I think of my job every day. And it sort of comes through that line going back to, to Lewis Mao, but not to just lean on the past, but how it comes forward in the work that everybody is still doing here. So again, I really appreciate having been able to be involved in that. Thank you. And Evan. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me okay. I feel bad that I'm looming over everyone in the background here. So uh, please treat me as if I'm just kind of sitting in that empty spot there. So thanks to everyone uh, for, for having me here today. Thanks for the, the folks at uh, the Science Technology Policy Program for allowing me to zoom in. Um, I have to be up here in New York. We're back in the office a few days a week, which is of why my background looks a little sparse here. Um, but just to follow on what everyone was saying, and especially at maybe to, to follow uh, from what Michelle was saying, I think that you could probably take uh, at random anyone that was in uh, my you know, class uh, in the program or a few years before, a few years after, and you would have an interesting set of perspectives. So I'm really honored to be the person that was asked to, to present here. Um, and I thought actually, again, maybe this follows nicely from what Michelle just said, that I wanted to share an interesting artifact of science and technology policy with respect to the program. So I don't know if you can see this, but these are actually the printed out notes that I received. I think this was from the first day of my first class of introduction to science and technology policy um, that was taught by Robert Rycroft and Nick Benordis. Um, you know, this is titled, What is Science and Technology Policy? And I actually have a stack of these from that class um, in my files at home. I guess that speaks to how much paper we all keep. But um, to, uh, to what Richard said, I actually refer to these notes on a regular basis. Um, I taught a course in science and technology policy a few years ago, um, and I went back to, to Bob's and, and Nick's notes and you know, you kind of read through this and I'll, I'll just read a little bit of this. So this is uh, themes in the course from, you know, back in uh, fall 2003. Um, and I remember sitting there and, and hearing things like debate over science and technology policy hinges implicitly on the conceptual models used. Science, science and uh, technological activities are messy and adaptive. Um, and there's really no coherent widely accepted theory of their operations that have been advanced. Um, to the extent that investigations in science and technology have opened these black boxes, they tend to rely on highly simplistic models, and especially the linear model of innovation. And I was flipping through these notes last night as I was thinking about this and kind of randomly picked up uh, some of the ones from the subsequent classes. And I couldn't believe at how useful and informative they were. Um, and I think that speaks to what everyone was saying, which is that the issues that I learned uh, in the program, so I started in 2003 and graduated in 2005, have been so informative to the work that I've done. I've been mostly in the philanthropic sector over the past uh, 12, uh, 14 years, but even when I was at uh, other jobs uh, in the nonprofit world, that the ideas that I learned about in terms of the history of science and technology policy, the institutions of science and technology policy, the key questions that arise um, in the field, have been so deeply informative and continue to be relevant to my thinking on a daily basis that I, it's hard to overstate. And in fact, you know, when I talk to people about, say, the history of the NSF or the difference between the National Science Foundation, the National Academy of Sciences, and the differences between FDA and NIH or EPA and DOE, these are characteristics of these federal science funding agencies that I was first introduced to you know, almost 20 years ago. And I'm always shocked when people don't have that knowledge and background. Um, and I actually realized how lucky I was to get this sort of solid introduction to how science policy is done in the US and around the world, um, that I'm frankly surprised that people don't have this information at their, uh, at their fingertips or sort of, sort of stored away in their memory. Um, and I realize now, you know, uh, two decades on from starting my program, how useful it was to learn about the alphabet soup of federal agencies that I was first introduced to um, uh, and how intertwined these issues of science and technology policy are to economics, bureaucracy, funding, international affairs, history and philosophy in some cases. 
Um, and, and, and I realized that, uh, you know, I don't think I would be where I am today without the experiences and networks that I built in the program. So just to give you a little bit of sense of uh, where I came from, and, and then I'll stop because I'm really interested in having a discussion. So I joined the program in 2003 from more of a philosophy of science background, which was very conceptual and theoretical and, 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 in, and interesting, but never really uh, what was sort of unsatisfying to me because I never really understood how decisions got made or how resources got allocated. So I, I was really happy that I frankly kind of stumbled on the program and uh, emailed uh, Nick Venortis uh, one day and said, I'd like to apply to this. And he said, sir, you should apply and was lucky enough to get in. And I actually deferred my admittance to a year to pursue some more work in philosophy of science. But then when I got to the program at GW, it was such an eye opener, like I said, because there were people here who understood how science technology policy worked. And the program was set up in such a unique way that provided the academic training on one hand, but also the real world experience in the other. So uh, I was counting this up. I had at least three different internships while I was at the program. I was at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I worked for a small uh, healthcare uh, NGO. Uh, I was able to spend some time at the National Academies as a science and technology policy fellow. Um, near the end of my time uh, in the program, I had a chance to go to South Korea and do some cross-country comparative science policy work. And each of those experiences not only helped to deepen my understanding of these issues that I was learning about in the classroom, uh, but all kind of built on themselves. And I continued to draw on the networks that I was able to develop during my few years in DC, um, even to this day, as, as Michelle said, we just had a chance to connect on some of these topics uh, just a few weeks ago. And you know, I'll say, especially for maybe the student, students that are in the audience now, um, I, I think what, Ma what Michelle said was right, that everyone thinks that they're in this sort of golden age of science policy. But I, I kind of wish I could go back and do the program again now, you know, 20 years uh, after having done it, because there's so much happening now in the science policy world. There's so much discussion about how do you fund innovation? Where do you fund innovation? Uh, what's the best place to do it? What's the best institutional structure to do it? What's the role of non-federal funders like corporations, philanthropies, in my case, um, independent science research organizations? Uh, how do you engage new participants in science? How do you fund interdisciplinary scholarship? Um, I think the experience we've all had over the past few years with the pandemic, um, trying to deal with other society relevant challenges like climate change, which I work on, have opened up so many interesting questions that I kind of wish I had the chance to dive back into them almost for the first time. Um, so while I, I don't have the opportunity to do that, um, I think that the students that are going through the program now um, have such a unique ability to both learn from folks that have been doing this for decades, but also turn their attention to so many interesting new questions that are coming up um, that I, I think there's really a long sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, I, th I think the future is bright for folks that are in this program. And uh, there are so many opportunities to sort of circle back and rethink how things were done in the past and sort of investigate new opportunities going forward. So um, I'm excited to hear the discussion and happy to uh, answer any questions that may come up. Great, thank you, Evan. Um, I, want to, I want to add that Evan, a couple of years ago, actually published a, an excellent book uh, because I have reviewed it. That's, that's how do I, I know it's excellent, uh, on philanthropy and the future of science and technology policy. This is, this is not the usual type of publication you get. You get the, the business, you get the government, but not philanthropy. Um, uh, and as we know, in many fields, uh, philanthropy and uh, philanthropic funders uh, are extremely important these days. So um, let's move to some questions. Scott, are you handling this? Or what? Um, yeah, uh, there is uh, uh, one question uh, that came in from uh, Michael S. materials in the program uh, from his office is still highly relevant to the work I do uh, with the World Bank uh, in many countries. I, I guess the, the, the question here is, great that we have these things in file, but what have you found is to be the most effective way to communicate 
some of these lessons without having somebody go through the whole program. What are sort of sort of the nuggets you try to get people to uh, you know get across or grasp uh, when you're trying to communicate with them in maybe a nice way? Evan or really anybody else? Yeah, I mean. So I, I try to talk about how um, what we learn here actually isn't academic in in the um, in, in the dismissive kind of way that some people would use those terms, right? So um, one of the one of the things that's uh, particularly interesting um, uh, through the combination of courses uh, that I took was this question of um, you know creative destruction. And the capacity for innovation to not just sort of rapidly change um, technology, but rapidly change markets, rapidly change the nature of who wins and who loses, and in 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 uh, major sort of economic shifts, and how um, you see that play out in ways that um, you don't that one wouldn't realize has a connection to these. What might, what might be labeled as theories, but are, are really practically important. And one way is um, I was at Stanford the year that um, there was an antitrust, uh, there were antitrust proceedings going on against Microsoft and some of its practices for the use of, uh, including um, whatever its browser was free in as part of Windows. Um, uh, you know, you can see it play out with decisions associated with where you, um, how you, how do you, do you embrace sort of, um, you know, free trade in a way that allows for um, movement of, of goods and services freely across borders? And what does that do for where jobs are? And, and how understanding that if somebody's making an argument to you that sounds like they're really an expert in economics, are you similarly expert in a way that you can understand, well, yeah, but you're including two of the four assumptions and you're ignoring the other two, and that's really important. And, and why, um, and, and, and that has impact on people's lives and people's jobs. Um, and, and why uh, from both a practical and a theoretical point of view, a decision by a, an administrator at NASA to uh, initiate a new kind of program uh, for transportation of services of cargo to the International Space Station can be this thing that unlocks a whole new era of innovation because one entrepreneur decided that he was going to take on uh, a, a traditional uh, market, a, a traditional approach to doing this inherently government mission, and and what does it mean to be inherently governmental uh, in an era of rapid innovation? Well, these are not theoretical academic issues. These are real, tangible issues that affect people's jobs. But you have a way of communicating them and understanding about them and realizing where there could be flaws in a good decision or a bad decision based on the fact that you have this solid foundational training. So when people ask me, like, what did I get out of, PH, out of a PhD, I, those are the kinds of answers that I give them. So the, uh, the point that just came up, the two out of four, this really resonates for me because this is, tends to be exactly what is missing in the, the widening of options part. And so the, I, I, okay, so, two points. So one in terms of my internal program um, staffing. So in, in addition to Vid, who came in trained from this program, I have two policy analysts, neither of whom have training either in anything in the policy or political realm or in subject matter. They've come completely from outside. One of them, for example, has an MA in linguistics. I was able to, in essence, train both of them the way I was trained here about breaking down the problem, the precision needed, and in somewhat of um, a, a European sense now, stakeholders. And this is where it sort of then reverberates back at the higher policy making level. And again, I'll, I'll speak mostly from a European perspective as this is where I've been doing the bulk of the work that European decision makers not only appreciate, but in essence require those stakeholder analyses. So to be able to say not just the two out of four points of view, but the five out of four points of view, what do these stakeholders um, want? What, 
who wins, who loses, what are those trade-offs? Um, and this is, again, all things that one can learn theoretically in that sense, but apply every day practically. And uh, the original target of the question, Evan, when, you, uh, when you're talking to donors or applicants and so forth, are there, are there cases where you, you pull out some of those old lessons to get people to reframe their questions or reframe their expectations? Yeah, so maybe I'll answer in a slightly different way, which is, um, you know, I, I think one of the interesting uh, things that I took away from the program is sort of breaking down the whole notion of the linear model of innovation and the kind of canonical view of the US funding system as in science, the endless frontier report. Um, you know, folks, I'm sure are familiar that there's sort of a whole bunch of essays being written now through issues in s and other places kind of rethinking science policy for the future and um, recognizing that many things that were sort of in those canonical descriptions of how US science policy is done really warrant, I mean, A, probably aren't true um, as as we all learned, B, um, if they are true, are probably problematic, and C, need to be rethought in a lot of ways. So, um, I guess the way that I think about it is, I use that kind of critical thinking and sort of recognition that a lot of the mythology that has been passed down for generations, it's important mythology, but you have to kind of you have to understand it um, warrants kind of re rethinking and reassessment and kind of de describing a new way of approaching science policy, actually. Um, so that's often the way that I approach it. Um, and in connection to the what I learned of the program, which is, you know, all the kind of canonical ways that science policy was discussed, you know, it's important to understand them, but it's also important to break down those myths and, and, and rethink them going forward. You have to understand the foundations before you can be critical of it. Basically. Um, then, okay, sort of lightning round, noting uh, time um, coming up uh, end is what one suggestion would panelists uh, have for how to improve the program, you know, going forward, okay? You know, you have all this wisdom, you here you are alumni and so forth. Um, you've heard a little bit about where we sort of are now. Um, what thing would you sort of airdrop in to improve the program or improve the experience going forward? Just one each. So I have one, which is um, uh, it's important to be able to write a five page to 10 page paper on justifying an argument or position you have. If you're gonna be a policy professional, you often have to write for people who don't read. So like place increased emphasis on nothing less than a page, nothing more than a page no argument has more time than five minutes to be made and you you've got to get it done in that kind of time frame and so i alluded to this actually in my remarks although it's clear that there is a research policy component to the to the lessons and the work um i would personally like to see that called out more explicitly there is a um, I think there's a sense sometimes that research policy is something that falls in the, you know, the average between science policy and technology policy and is really a different thing that requires um, perhaps different um, uh, ways of, not ways of thinking about it, but ways of approaching it. I agree, you have to be concise and write um, just some bullets and it's also important to include quantitative data and some real life example that people can remember and um, we at science indicators we always were very happy to know that we were trying to be very objective without giving policy solutions so that both sides or many sides of an argument could use our data with trust and objectivity so that's also important I um, just will add quickly that um, when I took the third year law class in environmental um, law, I agree that we're talking about different ways. I had to learn a whole new way of analysis 
And um, at the end, I had my, it was the third um, comprehensive exam. By that time, I was tired, and I'm like, writing, like this. And, and the professor said, finally, you're acting like a lawyer, taking a position and arguing it. So it's the, also learning different ways of analysis are important. I'll, I'll say just to chime in, I think, uh, alluding to what Nick mentioned, I think science policy increasingly takes place in lots of different places. So thinking about the role of the states, the role of foundations, the role of uh, other kinds of research entities, I think is an opportunity for exploration going forward. Okay, that's terrific. And uh, I think we're at the, uh, the end of our session. And uh, so those of us who are here in the room will have the uh, ability to, uh, to talk further with each other. Uh, for those folks online, uh, please rejoin us at uh, two o'clock. Nick?